From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Joe Matthew, I'm Kaylee Lyons. It's Super Tuesday, with voters in 15 states choosing between Donald Trump and Nikki Haley for the Republican nomination for president. Polls start closing at just under two hours in the East. We'll get perspective ahead from Charlie Cook of the Cook Political Report. And as artificial intelligence raises new concerns about election integrity and security, we'll speak with Ben Hovland, chair of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. Senator Kirsten Sinema announcing she will not run for re-election this year. We'll focus on the implications for the race in Arizona and the battle for control of the Senate. Just one more headline dropping in our laps today, Kaylee, on what was already a pretty busy one. Not expected to be a conclusive evening of voting here, but it'll certainly bring us a lot closer to knowing who the nominee will be. Absolutely. Of course, 1,215 delegates are what's needed to lock up the Republican nomination. Donald Trump isn't going to be able to secure that number tonight, even yeah. if he sweeps all 15 of these states, as he very well uh, could do. And the question tonight, Joe, is, is this Nikki Haley's last stand. That's right. We could be calling him the prohibitive nominee, if not the presumptive, that could come March 12th or 19th, depending on how the numbers work out here. Um, but this could be a difficult evening for Nikki Haley supporters and for the former ambassador herself. And joining us now around the table, Bloomberg's Wendy Benjaminson and Josh Wingrove. Happy Super Tuesday to both of you. The refrain <laughs> so far today, Wendy, has been not so super. Is this a coronation? Is there a sense of inevitability tonight? Yeah, there's not going to be a whole lot of drama tonight. It'll just be Trump's march across the country from Vermont to Alaska. That is the spread of states voting tonight. Yeah. And you're absolutely right that he won't clinch the nomination. But Nick, for Nikki Haley, the nomination will, if, if indeed Trump wins most, if not all, of these states. There's some question about Vermont or Virginia, maybe a little bit unlikely. If he marches through all these states, then... There's no way she can make up the math in time. So he will officially clinch it, as you said, later this month. But we will be surprised if we don't hear something definitive from Haley tomorrow. Hmm. Well, of course, what Nikki Haley has been saying is if you look at all the context, contests thus far, which aside from D.C., she hasn't outright won any of them, but she has been putting up numbers north of 40 percent in New Hampshire, Absolutely. almost 40 percent in North yeah. Carolina. And she yeah. keeps saying that shows a decent chunk of the Republican electorate does not want Donald Trump. How much will those kind of figures really matter when we're looking at the numbers coming in this evening? Well, that will matter to show that, because she's absolutely right, that is a gauge of voters who are not interested in Donald Trump having a second term. So, Republican voters, I should say. So the question is, where do they go in the general election? Mm -hmm. Do they hold their nose and vote for Trump because he's the Republican? Do they cross over and vote for Joe Biden? I don't know, maybe some will. But that's, that's really the crux. Is there, she is right. There is a large chunk of the Republican electorate that doesn't want Donald Trump. But in the general election, who knows where they're going to go. Josh Wingrove, there are uh, Democratic contests tonight as well with yeah. a guy named Joe Ish. Biden on the yeah. ballot. Ish, I guess we'll call it a nominating contest right. maybe. Um, Minnesota keeps coming up after what we saw in Michigan with the uncommitted movement, a protest movement uh, by many progressives specific to the president's policy in Israel and Gaza. We're looking tonight at Minneapolis. Is this a media thing we're looking for something to talk about or is this a real problem for Joe Biden? No, people are looking that, at that as well as North Carolina for that essentially protest vote mm -hmm. in states of different terms for it uncommitted, you know, yes. what have you. Um, we're, we're watching it because in Minnesota you've got a large Muslim American and Arab American community what we saw in Michigan is it spread to other communities, young people in particular, and of course the risk for Biden, who generally has a wider but flimsier voter base than Trump, who has a narrower but more ironclad voter base. He needs these people to show up. And so, you know, it kind of was uh, somewhere between underwhelming and overwhelming, the Michigan result. It was just enough for everyone's hot take to be validated, right? <laughs> so, you know, uh, so we'll see if we have a similar result today. The Biden people have been paying attention to this. I don't think their hair has been lit on fire. I will be watching, though, you know, if those numbers are consistently higher, that's a problem. But just to go back to the Nikki Haley conversation, one thing that we've noticed is she is outperforming her polls. Yeah. When we talk about her results, fairly consistently, there has been a polling error 
showing overstating Donald Trump's support. He's winning, and he's winning by large margins, yeah. but by smaller margins than expected. Mm. That, I think, is something to watch. If that keeps happening, that, A, says something about the Republican primary that Wendy has already uh, gone through, uh, but, B, I think, raises questions about, the, we, we yet again, stop me if you've heard this before, hmm. is the polling right? Do we right. know what's going on? Yes. Right, now, right now, one thing that suggests the polling is right is it's all kind of marching in the same direction. That is, Joe Biden is losing. The question out of tonight is really, like, can Joe Biden turn it around, and will Donald Trump's clinching of this sort of put him more front of mind to those independent voters, those voters with normal lives that aren't really paying attention to all this, in a way that kind of changes those numbers. Because right now, it, it would be very difficult to read this and not see Don, Donald Trump as the front runner. Wow. And of course, in addition to the actual presidential headlines of this evening, there's plenty of other races down ballot to pay attention to in Texas and California. One down ballot race that isn't actually in question tonight, but is in the news tonight, as uh, Joe mentioned, is Arizona. Because right. the independent senator from Arizona, who has left us guessing for some time as to whether or not she was seeking re-election, Kirsten Sinema, said today that she is not. Take a listen. I believe in my approach, but it's not what America wants right now. Because I choose civility, understanding, listening, working together to get stuff done, I will leave the Senate at the end of this year. So it will be a two-way race, Wendy, in Arizona. Ruben Gallego on the Democratic side, Carrie Lake on the Republican side, perhaps Cinema's announcement isn't all too surprising, but how much does this really put a spotlight on the balance of the Senate and the role Arizona could play in deciding that come November? Well, it absolutely puts the spotlight on that. It also puts the spotlight on sort of the state of American politics, right? She's a centrist. She's in that sort of Joe Manchin camp. She was a Democrat. She became an independent. She caucused with the Democrats. I think I've got that right. Yes. And she's, um, <laughs> she's very confusing to watch. And now the race is between a progressive Democrat on the left wing of the party and Carrie Lake, who is a Trump acolyte from the get-go. Still and contesting the results of her still contesting, race. Right. right. And probably still contesting the 2020 presidential election. So those are the people then who will be the nominees for the Senate seat. So either way, you're getting someone from the um, extremes of, of the party where someone like Cinema, someone like Romney, someone like Manchin has no place. Oh, you, you covered Trump land, Josh. Mm. Did Carrie Lake just fall off? The, the short list for vice president if she was on it because he needs her to win that Senate seat. When she said she was running for the Senate seat, I think that's when most people concluded that she'd been given indication that she would not be <laughs> the vice president. Otherwise, she might not have jumped in. I think this is good news for Ruben Gallego. You know, a lot of the polls have shown in a three-way race, he's losing votes, obviously, yes. to cinema, who for all intents and purposes was the at least lowercase d, Democratic senator from the state. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, this is going to be a narrower race. We've seen in past cycles that the Trumpy candidates that are put up in the Senate races have cost the Republican seats. If Trump had not put his thumb on the scale as much in the Senate, Republicans could have, I don't know, 53 seats in the Senate right now. You know, it's a big difference. So the question is, is Arizona going to be that all over again? But this is a brutal map for yeah. Democrats. It, most people do not think they will hold the Senate. Mm -hmm. They can afford to lose one. They might lose significantly more than one. Who knows, particularly if Joe Biden's numbers don't come up. Mm -hmm. But the betting odds seem to be that Democrats like their chances in the House. They're not so hot on their you know, chances Kaylee, in the Senate. Maryland and the on the presidency. Table. Who knows? Yeah, gets even more Larry, Larry, right, Larry right. Hogan, absolutely. You make the point about Joe, num Joe Biden's numbers not being uh, fantastic in yeah, many uh, different metrics. On the economy, <laughs> on the border, he's getting poor marks. But also increasingly, on the progressive side, we're seeing a lot of... Uh, uh, angst around his stance when it comes to Israel, given what we are happening, what we're seeing happen in Gaza, which raises the ceasefire question. That's something the administration is actively working on. It would be a temporary ceasefire. And Biden asked a question, was asked a question about this by a reporter today. Here was his response. It's in the hands of Hamas right now. The, uh, the Israelis have been cooperating. There's an offer out there that's rational. We don't know what We'll know in a couple of days if it's going to happen. But we need the ceasefire. So, Josh, he, the president says he doesn't know what's going to happen. Is that a sign that the U.S., frankly, just doesn't have much leverage or sway in these conversations with Israel? It sure looks like things are stalled, but they're saying at least that Israel, it depends on who you ask, they're saying Israel's on board with this deal that they've been talking about since Saturday. And they had Kamala Harris come out on Sunday with kind of a, 
have cake, eat too statement where she called for a ceasefire and then said it's up to Hamas. That's exactly what's on the table, <laughs> which are not really the same thing. Uh, but so what we're dealing with right now is the U.S. is pressuring Hamas to take this deal. The terms as they've described it, the Americans have described it, is that if Hamas releases vulnerable hostages, women, ill, injured, elderly, then this deal is a six-week ceasefire that could potentially lead to a longer term with other types of conditions. There's just been no indication yet that that'll happen. And John Kirby in the briefing today candidly kind of really was not setting expectations particularly high for a breakthrough. They say they're hopeful and they maybe something will get done before this sort of targeted Ramadan beginning, but it sure seems like things are sliding in the wrong direction. We're getting dueling narratives. Yeah. But essentially the U.S. has been trying to uh, ramp up pressure on Hamas, sort of you know, say the word ceasefire, at least right. aloud, <laughs> regardless of what words are on either side of it, to try to speak to their progressive base. And that's what we're seeing in Michigan and Minnesota and mm -hmm. all these places. They're trying to respond to Democrats saying that they want more pressure, more you know, uh, anger from the vice president and the president. All right, Bloomberg's Josh Wingrove and ben Wendy Benjaminson, thank you both so much for joining us on this Super Tuesday. And coming up, we'll continue our Super Tuesday conversation and be joined by Charlie Cook of the Cook Political Report for the historical perspective of what this day means and whether it's as exciting in 2024. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio, and the race for president ultimately is a numbers game as the candidates compete for delegates during primary season. And Tyler Kendall has the details on the math of that. Tyler. Hey, Kaylee. When it comes to the Republican primary, the magic number is 1,215. That's the amount needed of delegates to secure the nomination. About a third of those are up for grabs this Super Tuesday. Former President Trump is currently leading with 273 delegates. Former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley has 43 delegates. The math works out that neither candidate will be able to reach the threshold needed tonight. Despite Trump's lead, Haley has vowed to stay in through this Super Tuesday contest as Republican voters in 15 states go to the polls. I'm not giving up this fight when a majority of Americans disapprove of both Donald Trump and Joe Biden. We're headed to the Super Tuesday states throughout all of next week. We'll keep fighting for America and we won't rest until America wins. Most of the Super Tuesday states have a winner-take-all system. That means the total number of delegates in big states like California and Texas will give all of their delegates to the candidate that clinches more than 50 percent of the vote. An expert I spoke with said that could open the door to an insurmountable lead. Once you start winning, you really build up this sense of momentum. So even if a competitor is doing fairly well, they could get 49.9 percent of the vote in each of these states. But no matter what, you will always win all of the delegates. So that could create a sense um, that a candidate really is the runaway choice of the party. The Trump campaign says they expect later this month to have enough delegates to secure the nomination. That could come on March 12th or more likely March 19th, depending how the vote shakes out on those primary days. Despite the former president's lead, uh, Nikki Haley's campaign has raised a combined $28.5 million so far in 2024. She says that's part of why she committed to stay in through at least tonight's contest. Joe and Kaylee, keep in mind, since 1988, no Republican has become the party's nominee without winning a majority of the Super Tuesday states. All right, Tyler, thank you. Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall with the setup here to a conversation that we've been looking forward to. Perspective on this particular Super Tuesday with Charlie Cook, the founder of the Cook Political Report. It's a treat to have you here, Charlie. Thanks for coming back to see us on Bloomberg. So tell it like it is. Nothing matters anymore, right? It's not I'm, that super. I'm going to be a curmudgeon. This is not a very super Tuesday. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of anticlimactic. This because this know. is already over. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of over. And, and even even though, uh, as 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 I think Josh put it, put our Wendy put it, pointed earlier, a quarter of the house is up, but mm -hmm. most of those races outside of that that state or that district aren't terribly interesting. So 
this is going to be the start of, you know, the longest general election we've ever had. Long, kind of like the Bataan Death March. I mean, this is going to be an ugly, ugly year. But you'll Can't be wait. there. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're, we're going to be there. We're buckling up now as we yeah, speak. However ugly it may be. Indeed. So I guess my question is, is there really nothing that the results today can teach us about the strength of either of these candidates, Trump or Biden, as they head into this general election contest? If you're seeing low turnout, if you're seeing Trump losing a significant amount uh, of the vote share to Nikki Haley, is that not telling in some way? What can we actually glean? I'm I'm looking for a sliver of hope here. (laughs) I'm going to do a shameless promotion of the Bloomberg News Morning Consult poll. (laughs) Wow. The swing state polls that you guys released last week, Mm -hmm. those tell you everything everything you need to know, Mm. that right now the president is behind in all seven swing states, and six of them he carried last time. This this race is a lot harder than I think many Democrats really appreciate because because Democrats waste a lot of votes by running up the score, you know, winning California by five million and New York by two million and all this, <laughs> that what happens is a Democrat probably needs to win the national popular vote by four or five percentage points before that's going to translate into an electoral college majority, that, that Republican votes are just more efficiently allocated around the country. Well, and of those polls that are swing states that were in our poll, two of them are voting. North Carolina, Minnesota, they have primaries yeah. today. Will you look but, at that? But no. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean no, the thing is that, that, that um, you've got a lot of other programming. <laughs> I mean, no, no the, the thing is, seriously, you know, your poll is the best thing to look at if people are looking to get insight into what November, mm. how it could could shape up. Because that's where, you know, it, you know, the president's chances live and die in those states, those seven states. Yeah. Mm. And it's 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 going to be tough for it. You've made the notion uh, that national polls inflate Democrats standings. Yeah. Then. So is it time to start blowing holes in, in this argument that Nikki Haley is, in fact, a more powerful threat to Joe Biden, that she's the one who beats Biden, not Donald Trump, because he's winning all of those seven swing states? No, I, I, the thing is. Almost, almost any, almost any other Republican would beat Biden handily. Right now, I think Trump has an advantage. But would Haley win, uh, win by going away? Of course she would. But you know what? Either you guys have a better chance of winning the Republican nomination than she does right now. She's running <laughs> wow. for 2028, whether well, she knows it or not. And how she does will, you know, lift or or depress her standing going into the next one in 2028. Huh. So her decisions here in the next 24 hours might be pretty important. Well, and, I, and to be honest, I don't think the turnout is going to be, and these primaries are going to be that, 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 that huge. Mm. I mean, the key is going to be the 8 or 10% that, uh, that are pure independents in a general election. They're not primary voters, and they don't like either candidate. And... Um, mm. um, they tend to read, watch, listen to news less than other people, uh, and they vote not on the economy but their economy. Mm. And do I feel like I was better off before January twentieth, two thousand twenty-one, or since? Mm. And those kinds of polls, those kinds of numbers, whether the national polls this past weekend or your poll, uh, those are the numbers that are just really troubling. For the president. I mean, this is the first you know, presidential election since 1892 that you had back-to-back presidents running, which allows yeah, for a right. side-by-side comparison. Was I better off then? Am I better off now? And um, whether, regardless of how voters should look at it, they have a very rosy impression, not just the economy, but, you know, most of these issues, they think things were better off then. Mm-hmm. And that's a real challenge for the president. Well, to your point on turnout perhaps being low in the primary, I also wonder when we're thinking about the turnout we could see in November and and to return to the point about this is going to be an incredibly long general election Mm -hmm. campaign. Should we draw a correlation between the length of the campaign and the likelihood of voters to turn out if they're just completely exhausted by being just flooded with this kind of material for effectively what is going to be an eight-month-long period? Yeah, I mean, we, we had 2018 was like the highest midterm election turnout ever. Mm. And 2020 was huge. This one's going to be really, really low because people are trying to choose who they who do they hate the least. 
you know? And, I mean, I hate being like this because my, my wife says I'm a pathological optimist, and I know I don't sound <laughs> that way, but, you know, when I get kind of down... Imagine you know. the fatigue. <laughs> huh? The fatigue. Yeah. The yeah. ads, the speeches. People yeah. will be done with both of them if they are already. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is that the Republican Party, there's plenty of talent in both parties, you know, and... Any, any other Democrat, almost any other Democrat, would beat President Trump fairly easily. But the question is, can Biden beat him? Yeah. Just 20 seconds, Charlie. No labels? Can <laughs> they run a candidate? Should they? They've always said Super Tuesday was their marker. I wish they would run candidates in Senate and House races around the country where there's no electoral huh. college. Huh. With the electoral college, a, a third party or independent candidate, they can be a spoiler, but they can't be a victor. There, there aren't 270 electoral votes there. Hmm. And Fair. so the thing is, there's nothing wrong with the U.S. Senate that four or five really independent senators wouldn't help, or the House that a couple dozen in the House that's wouldn't. Not. That's where that's where they could actually do some real good. Yeah. All right, Charlie Cook, great to see you this evening. Thank you, Thank you so Thank much you. for joining us. And we'll have more coverage of Super Tuesday coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. I think the no labels folks are, are good people and I think they've they had an interesting idea. I just don't think it's going to pan out myself, given that more people, unfortunately, in America right now, more people are voting out of fear than opportunity. And what I mean by that is you'll have a lot of Republicans that might say, look, I don't like this Trump guy, but um, I, I'm not going to vote for the third party because it might give it to Biden. And Democrats will say, look, I sure as heck don't think Biden's going to be successful. But if I vote for the third party, it might give it to Trump. Republican Governor Chris Sununu of New Hampshire speaking with us this time yesterday here on Balance of Power. Kaylee, you just posed this no labels question to Charlie Cook, and it's it's getting a lot of shrugs here. Mm -hmm. It seems like if there ever was a window for this to happen, it may have closed. Granted, they only have ever said their window would be post Super Tuesday. That's they weren't going to make a call until after these contests were over. And if it was a Trump Biden matchup, that is when they would run a so called unity ticket. But yeah. the question we all have is who would be on that ticket? We all thought maybe Joe Manchin. He's a right. no. Maybe Mitt Romney would run with Joe Manchin. He said no. He threw cold water on that. Larry Hogan was co chair of No Labels, he's and now running he's for running Senate. for Senate in Maryland. So I'm not sure who you have left that could, could even be part of this. Well, I think Effort. you do, because you brought it up earlier in the newsroom. Another name raised today as she announces she's not running for re-election, Kirsten Sinem. The independent we got to run that by the panel later. Yeah, but of course, she would need a running mate. Well, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> Coming up, we'll be joined by Benjamin Hovland, chair of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, as we talk about election integrity and security on this Super Tuesday. It's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. Colorado is considered the nation's gold standard for our elections, both in terms of access and security, uh, in part because we send a mail ballot to every active voter, and we also have early voting. So actually, ballots went out the week of February 12th, and Coloradans have already been voting. That was Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold on with us yesterday here on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. And joining us now for more conversation around the security of this election as voters head to the polls on this Super Tuesday, Benjamin Hovland, chair of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. Ben, great to see you here in our Washington, D.C. studio. And as we talk about the 2024 uh, election, the cycle we are in now, it's worth noting the front runner for the Republican nomination still calls doubt upon the results of the 2020 election. He repeatedly suggests that it was stolen from him, even if that is factually inaccurate. And as recently as January, surveys have been done by the Washington Post and University of Maryland that suggest more than a third of Americans said the 2020 election was illegitimate. How do you avoid that same perception in 2024? Uh, well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And, you know, I think one of the big things is for people to make sure that they're getting their information about how elections are administered from trusted sources, getting that from the state and local election officials who run our elections. Uh, when you look at all the data, when you look at 
uh, you know, through all the court cases, what we've seen time and time again is that the 2020 election was run well, uh, that, uh, and that it was trustworthy. Uh, and certainly I anticipate 2024 being the same. But again, when people are getting that election information, it's critical that they get it from trusted sources. What's a night like this uh, like for you? Most Americans don't know that your agency even exists. <laughs> is, there a, is there a control room, a war room somewhere where you're monitoring results from around the country? Do you have real-time information coming in on Super Tuesday? Uh, so yes, uh, one of the things that's really happened since 2017 in 2017, election infrastructure was designated critical infrastructure. Uh, and so there is a command center working with our federal partners and then uh, connecting also with, with state and local partners across the country. And it really has increased the communication and the visibility across the country. And it helps us to know if there are things, you know, again, so far today, uh, it has been uh, like many other election days. There have been uh, a few things here and there, but but that's what election officials prepare for. Mm -hmm. uh, that is that is part of the job. And so, uh, you know, while the polls are getting close to closing around the country uh, in a number of states with primaries today, uh, you know, for many election officials, that's just the beginning of the work. Uh, you know, the parts of the process that continue on to ultimately certify those results, mm -hmm. uh, you know, require checking and rechecking, dotting the I's, crossing the T's, double checking the math and making sure that everything adds up. And that's part of why election night results are never official. Uh, and then you wait for those official certified results uh, because it gives election officials the time to do that critical work. Well, so let's talk about the people who are actually doing the work, election officials, poll workers, for example. We saw in 2020 that a lot of poll workers did not have an easy time during that election. Some of them ended up being defamed, even getting uh, payout settlements uh, from the likes of Rudy Giuliani, who was working with Trump at the time. Are people as willing to work at the polls now in the aftermath of that? Are there enough of them willing to do this work? Yeah, you know, there have been uh, there have been some stories that certainly many of us have heard and, and are really unfortunate and, and are unacceptable. Uh, threats, harassment of election officials, completely unacceptable, and, and they should, people who do that should be prosecuted. Uh, that said, uh, it's amazing to see so many Americans who are willing to serve in this way. Uh, I've been a poll worker myself a number of times, uh, and it's really being the customer service face of our democracy, you know, helping your friends and neighbors to participate in the process and make their voice heard. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, we need more people to sign up for that. Uh, you know, earlier talking about talking about what's happening today across the country with people voting uh, in primaries, there are thousands uh, there are the election officials who are the people that do this full time. And then there are poll workers who are volunteers uh, who are just like your viewers who have stepped up and decided to serve for today as a poll worker. Uh, and, and those folks are always needed. Uh, and again, it's a great way to serve. And as we go through the rest of this year, uh, there will be state primaries. Uh, there will be the general election. Uh, and so anyone that's interested in checking that out, finding out more, signing up, mm -hmm. can do that at helpamericavote.gov. Well, we appreciate what they do. We talk about politics here every day. We wouldn't have anything to talk about if they weren't right. there to do their jobs. Uh, the EAC has something new to deal with called AI. To what extent is artificial intelligence complicating your mission? You know, that's absolutely something we're paying attention to. Uh, I think at this point, what you're most likely to see out of AI uh, is it lowers the barrier to entry and maybe ramps up the volume a little bit uh, around things like mis and disinformation than we've been seeing. Uh, and really, that makes it so much more critical uh, to invest in voter education and ensure that Americans out there who are watching this get their information from those trusted sources that I mentioned earlier, uh, their state or local election official. Mm -hmm. So AI feels like it's something that has been emergent more recently, a big theme in 2023 and 2024. But when we think about this election cycle compared to, to years past, what else is, is new or perhaps threatening that, you, that you're thinking actively about that might worry you? Uh, you know, I think there's uh, one of the things uh, that I think about a lot is what is going to be the story of the election. Uh, and every year, uh, every election, it's a little bit different. And so there's, there are pieces of it that we surely don't know yet. Uh, you know, looking back at 2020, uh, at this point, uh, you know, there was still, uh, you know, we still had not sort of seen the, what the pandemic was going to be, sure. of course. And, and so, uh, you know, there's always that. Uh, 
But really, one of the big things that's changed in the last few years is that election officials have so many challenges. Uh, you know, there is the mis- and disinformation. There, of course, continues to be the concerns around cybersecurity, uh, threats of physical uh, physical threats and harassment, and really it just increases the importance of funding our elections, of investing in our elections, and making sure that our election officials have the resources they need uh, to do the job. Benjamin, it's great to see you. We appreciate your being with us Thank this you. evening on Bloomberg. On this Super Tuesday, Benjamin Hovland, chair of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. Coming up, Senator Kirsten Sinema says she is not running for re-election this year. Finally announcing her decision today, our political panel is here to help us through this development coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. I believe in my approach, but it's not what America wants right now. Because I choose civility, understanding, listening, working together to get stuff done, I will leave the Senate at the end of this year. Senator Kirsten Sinema announcing she is not running for re-election. As we turn our attention to our political panel for the implications here in the balance of power on Capitol Hill, Matt Gorman is with us, targeted victory vice president alongside Megan Hayes, chief of staff at the American International Group, former special assistant to President Joe Biden. It's great to have both of you with us here. Kirsten Cinema, am I supposed to look to the Democrat or the Republican here to ask you <laughs> what this means for the balance of power in the Senate? Matt, in Arizona, this might have made things easier for the Democrat or more difficult? What are we looking at? It depends. It depends how good of a job Carrie Lake does remaking herself okay. from her race for governor mm -hmm. just a couple of years ago. If Cinema ran as a third party, a lot of the business community would have probably st stood with her. If they can sell themselves to possibly get with Carrie Lake, maybe some of them will go with her. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, Gallego consolidates a lot of that vote. Well, I also think it's interesting to consider Senator Cinema's message here when she announced that she wasn't going to try to return to the Senate. She said it's because she believes in, in civility mm. and she believes in, in the way she <laughs> conducts herself, but effectively that it, it is not reflected in, in Congress right now. I just wonder, Megan, to what extent you view that as, as a comment on the institution and mm -hmm. where we are in 2024 in these bodies. I mean, it's definitely a rich comment, but I do agree that we're going to, the Democrats will consolidate the vote and have a much better chance of winning. And, you know, and I think that she probably saw the, the writing that it wasn't going to be a favorable and it was going to be a tough uphill battle for her. So that's a plus for Joe Biden then. She, she was arguably a thorn in his side for the last couple of years. <laughs> Build back better, anybody? Um, maybe he can do this over again in Arizona. I mean, I think that would be great, and I think that he's probably looking forward to that. I know that they had a good working relationship at the end of the day, but um, I did think they? some change. When I was in the White House, yeah. you know, she was there a lot, and they did have a good rapport. Um, at the end, you know, she did come around for a lot of things. So, But I do think that this is a positive for Democrats in Arizona. Mm -hmm. Well, and then when we consider how this factors into the map for Senate control overall, you now have a question in Arizona. You have a question for sure in Ohio where Sherrod Brown could be vulnerable. John Tester could be vulnerable in Montana. You could look to Pennsylvania. We could even now, Matt, look to Maryland because Larry Hogan is running for, for a Senate seat. Realistically, how many Republican pickups could there be in November? It's all going to come down to the split ticket vote. Mm -hmm. In 2000, presidential years, 10 senators won their state, won their races when the presidency went the other way. In 2020, won. Susan Collins, that's it. So the split, the trend of split ticket voting has decreased in recent years. So for folks like Sherrod Brown to survive, John Tester, but also Larry Hogan to pick up a seat. You need that trend to go up a little bit. And also one other point, Manchin gone, Cinema now gone. That filibuster's on a knife's edge right now, no matter who takes over. Didn't we see a kind of an exception to that in Georgia, though? When Republicans went to vote, they either left that top vote blank or they wrote somebody in for president and then went R all the way down the rest of it. Doesn't Donald Trump bring some noise to that? He theory? certainly could. And it, it, I think it depends, too, on how, you know, what we see from Trump. Really, I think, do, do people put their jerseys on come mm -hmm. the fall? Mm -hmm. And does that translate down the ballot? Well, as we think about uh Trump, of course, in the presidential contest, but also Kirsten Sinema's future. I was tossing this around in the newsroom today because we've all been talking about 
Super Tuesday being the date <laughs> after which no label said if it's looking like a Trump-Biden rematch, they would run a unity ticket. And we know that Manchin's out, Romney's out, Larry Hogan, too, is now out. So when she dropped out, I said, cinema for no labels? Megan, you think that could be a possibility? I think no labels had to always run on the premise that they weren't going to do anything that would reelect Trump or be a benefit to Trump. And I think that at the end of the day, they're going to come to that conclusion really? and not run anybody and not, and not participate and run someone. Okay, so then you look at RFK Jr. as maybe the next spoiler on the list. If he's pulling 15%, in a Quinnipiac poll. Is he not on the radar in the Biden camp? I mean, I definitely think he's on the radar, as is everyone, but, I mean, the Biden campaign is running against You him. could argue he'd spoil it for Trump, by the way, right? He I might mean, have more in common with Trump voters than Biden's. Totally, but we, we have a two-party <laughs> system here, yeah. and, and that, that's, you know, I don't think any third-party candidates made, like, a real um, go at it. And I do think, though, that the Democrats will consolidate behind Joe Biden at the end of the day. And I think that they will, the campaign is obviously tracking that. But I, I don't think that RFK will have a, a real chance at pulling a lot of votes from the president. All right. Well, Megan and Matt, hold those thoughts because we have now ventured into the presidential race. <laughs> We're going to talk more about that coming up because our political panel will weigh in with what to watch in these Super Tuesday contests. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This isn't an anti-Trump movement. This is a pro-America movement. This is something where they're saying they're tired of the chaos. They don't want two candidates in their 80s. They want to make sure that we go back to normal. And they want to see a D.C. that works for, for the people instead of, government, instead of people working for government. That was Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley on CNN yesterday. Back with us now here on Bloomberg TV and radio is our political panel, Matt Gorman, targeted victory vice president, and Megan Hayes, chief of staff at the American International Group and former special assistant to President Biden. So we heard from Nikki Haley there, still very much in this race. She has long said she would be in this through Super Tuesday, through today's contest. We haven't gotten as much indication of what exactly comes after today. She's just said she'll stay in if she remains competitive. Matt, what to you tonight could Haley put up that would suggest she is still competitive when all the math is suggesting that, frankly, when it comes to getting delegates and securing the nomination, she, she's not? I mean, competitive is a relative term. <laughs> sure. uh, you know, I, look, Loosely I, defined. Yeah, absolutely. I think essentially she's a protest candidate right now. I, I don't, there's no real mathematical way. I would candidly be surprised if she won a state. I really genuinely would. I think, you know, you look at some of the places like California where Trump allies have been working on this for years where it was not, it's not proportional allocation of delegates anymore. It's 50 percent plus one. You get the whole thing. So she's looking at places like Vermont and smaller areas like that, Utah caucuses. But really, like, you know, he's going to come out of here with an 800 delegate lead most likely. Battleground Vermont is where we're focused. Yeah. <laughs> so it's going to come down to the Trap family vote, I think, at some point uh, here. Uh, Joe Biden's got some contests tonight as well. And we were talking earlier about what might happen in Minnesota. Is this uncommitted movement or the protest vote against Joe Biden by way of his policy in Israel and Gaza something you're watching? I mean, I think, yes, everyone's watching that. I think the campaign's watching it. The White House is watching it closely. But at the end of the day, this isn't something that's different than Obama faced in 2012. There mm -hmm. were five or six states that also had fairly large uncommitted votes in the primaries. I think at the end of the day and, the, you know, in, in November, all these folks will get behind him. So I don't think it's necessarily something that, like, everyone needs to be red flag alarmed by. Sure. But I do think, I mean, it's something to watch. But also this is how people, this is what you do in elections. This is you putting your voice forward right. and Even wanting to be heard. You have uncommitted delegates as well at the convention. Mm -hmm. They can still align with Joe Biden. That's the absolutely. expectation, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that they will at the end of the day. And this is just how folks get their voice heard. And this is what the democratic process is all about. Well, as we consider Minnesota specifically as well, it's worth pointing out that a congressman from Minnesota technically is competing <laughs> against Joe Biden. Dean oh, Phillips true. is still yeah. in this thing. He actually posted on X today as the only candidate not losing to Donald Trump in any poll. I'm grateful for the beautifully orchestrated outpouring of wishes to end my mission to ensure his defeat. He says he's touched by that thoughtfulness and will be making decisions over the you coming think he's days. He's been hearing from some people on Twitter. Probably. I mean, but we've all been talking about Nikki Haley's last stand. Could this yeah. be Dean Phillips' I mean, last I stand, Megan? I don't know if he had a first stand for it to be a last stand, but <laughs> sure. I'm, t Nikki Haley's like actually mounting in. A you leave no run. story untouched. <laughs> well, you know, we, we know that. the bases here. He's in the race. God knows he, it. We interviewed him in New Hampshire. <laughs> we did indeed. Campaign's still on.
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it brings us back to this idea of third party, which doesn't seem to be going anywhere. America's mm-hmm. going to have to start getting to grips with the fact that these two old men are going to be the nominees, yes? Absolutely. I mean, look, the third party always sounds good in theory, but look, the way we're broken down into very binary choices, right, whether mm-hmm. pro or for against abortion, things like that, where there's really no third option here. Uh, in many respects. And so it, it always sounds great when people float these names, but eventually one or the other, they're going to have to come down on these things, and yes. it never really works out. Right. No Labels has the ballot access, which is hard to do, but to uh, Megan's point, can they find someone to do to mm-hmm. take advantage of it? Well, it also raises the question, though, of all of those people who in, could show up in primaries tonight and vote for Nikki Haley, even if that vote doesn't get her further toward becoming uh, the Republican nominee because of winner-take-all, where those votes would go in a general election matchup between Trump and Biden. Are you of, of the mind that a lot of those voters are never Trump voters, which is why they're casting a vote for her? It's more against him than, than yes. for her. And therefore, is that a boon to Biden? Or would those people go for a third party? Are they likely to just sit out entirely? I think if you're voting against in, in a primary, you're going to vote somewhere. You're going you're to crawl the ballot box. Okay, so you're going to at least show up. You're going to show up, yeah. I, I do think, though, a lot of these folks you're seeing for Haley, right? She's thrived in open primaries, closed primaries she hasn't done as well at. I think what she's looking for are those folks that maybe voted against Trump in 2020 and are, quite frankly, likely to vote for Biden Mm. or a third party in 2024. I I highly doubt that the people voting for Haley, a lot of them, will be voting for Trump. So we've established over the course of this hour that there may not be a lot of surprises in the presidential contest tonight. (laughs) Some of the down-ballot races are actually fascinating, none more than the jungle primary in California. I can't wait for your take on this. What Adam Schiff has been up to, spending $10 million in ads to essentially elevate a Republican, a baseball star, as it were, Steve Garvey, the former Dodger World Series champion. This is the the so-called jungle primary because the top two vote getters end up being the general election. Is that what we're looking at here, Schiff? Versus Garvey? I mean, I, don't, I, I haven't been following that race extremely close, so I couldn't tell you what the poll numbers are saying. But I do think that it's an interesting concept because you you did have someone basically helping another candidate that's not another Democrat. So yeah. it's, it's that's an interesting concept. But it, I mean, it's smart strategy on his part if if it works out for him. Hmm. Are there any other down ballot races on the Democratic side that you're that you're paying close attention to in terms of it, whether they could be tells for wider sentiment heading into November? I think the the biggest tell going into November is how many people are voting for, for Haley and how those people are going to be never Trump voters and like what that means for Joe Biden. Let's tell you what, we've got our eye on Texas. Who's going to run against Ted Cruz? Ted Cruz. Mm. That's one you're watching tonight. Absolutely. There's a lot of excitement down in Texas. Yeah. Colin Allred uh, is right. probably the, the prohibitive favorite down there to run against Ted Cruz. Also, Sheila Jackson Lee, the congresswoman from right around the Houston area. How much Originally, trouble is she in? She's in some trouble. She's been outraised a lot, and now she has a head, uh, head start. Her, or she, her opponent has a head start. Mm-hmm. When she ran for the Houston mayoral race, took her eye off the ball, her opponent could absolutely win. She's young, pretty dynamic. I wouldn't be surprised if she pulled off an upset tonight. Mm. Okay, so all of that is what's happening tonight, Super Tuesday. Of course, it is a big deal, maybe less so than in the past, because we kind of know what outcomes other than these down-ballot races (laughs) are are going to be. But that's just part of what's a big week here in Washington, because two days from now, Thursday, Megan, is Biden's State of the Union Mm -hmm. address. If we're already effectively talking about him being in a general election campaign at that point with Trump, the almost presumptive nominee, what does he need to message on Thursday. I think he needs to message what he's done for the country and what he's done for people in the first three years. He's accomplished more in the three years than most people accomplish in two terms with the infrastructure and the IRA and and um, some different initiatives. I also think he needs to lay out a vision moving forward. I think he's going to probably lay out a contrast of if you want democracy and you want freedom for your make a choice on reproduction or reproductive rights, like I'm your person against someone who's not. So I think that, you know, he'll lay out his success, his vision for the future, and then I think the contrast to Trump. He just got back to the White House a little while ago from Mm -hmm. Camp David up Mm -hmm. there for three days, polishing the speech. We're not hearing from him tonight, interestingly. Not a thank you to voters, I think is interesting. We're also not hearing from Nikki Haley. What's up with that? I was very surprised at that. And I think more than anything else, that tells me where her team is setting expectations of the night. If you think you're going to succeed anywhere, throw a party, get some earned media off it, set a narrative for the coming days. Yeah. Hasn't done that. So I, I, I be, I'm, that really perked my ears up when I heard that she wasn't doing anything tonight. So Donald Trump has the last word on Super Tuesday. Yeah, Megan, is it a mistake for Biden not to speak tonight? 
knowing he's speaking Thursday? No, I think he's going to lay out his message for the for the country on Thursday. It's a really big moment. He's a sitting president, so he needs to be the president. He hasn't captured all the delegates to be the official, you know, nominee. So I think it's it's a safe strategy to not speak tonight, especially with a massive speech on Thursday. That's so important. Biggest audience will get until the convention. Exactly. <laughs> great conversation and great panel, Megan Hayes. Great to have you and Matt Gorman. Great to have you both at the table. Check out the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online because you're going to need something to do between <laughs> now and when we're back at 8 o'clock. Yeah, that's right. We're going to be back in just a few hours, 8 p.m. on Bloomberg Radio, the 9 to 11 p.m. on both radio and television and YouTube as well. So we'll see you later on this evening. This is Bloomberg.